Good afternoon. Um, my name is Mark Schmidt. I'm the director of the political reform program here at New America. And we have been navigating the shoals of American politics through the pandemic era and before and kind of adjusting our thinking as we go along. And so we're really excited to have this discussion of a new book called uh, Pandemic Politics. Uh, but it's by, by three authors, uh, one of whom will join us and we'll also have commentary from, from others uh, that I'll, I'll introduce. Uh, uh, Shana kushner Gadarian, who's a professor at the Maxwell School of Public Policy at Syracuse University uh, and in the political science department there, is uh, one of the three authors of the book who'll be joining us. Um, the other two are Sarah Wallace Goodman and Tom Papinski. Uh, Shana has been a um, uh, participant in our uh, electoral reform research group here at New America and is really a leading uh, thinker about, about um, current American politics. Uh, before I turn it over to, to Shana to talk a bit about the book, I just want to emphasize that I've been just thrilled by reading this book. It's just a fascinating take, extremely readable, while it also has all the, you know, all the um, apparatus of solid political science and a lot of survey research that's gone into it. But it's really, uh, it, it's a real reminder of how, in, what an intense period that was as politics interwove with the pandemic in, in really complex ways. And they really kind of show the state of American politics as the, at the point where the pandemic started and the all the factors that fed in afterwards, which are not just, you know, Trump, but also the nature of American federalism and a lot of other a lot of other challenges we faced. So um, I will be, I will turn it over to Shana and then we'll have a discussion that will include uh, Apurva Mandavili, who's a reporter at the New York Times, who covered the pandemic as deeply and, and intensely in all its aspects as as anyone, and Ashley Kersinger, who's the uh, director of survey methodology at Kaiser Health News Service. So we've got a couple different perspectives on this that will kind of flesh out the uh, the political science. Uh, I'm not going to do more than that on biographies of either person. If you hop back to our events page, there's a link where you can see more detail on, on, on each of the panelists. And uh, I want to thank all of you for participating. With that, let me turn it over to Shana. All right. So I'm going to give a kind of brief overview of the argument of the book and the data. My um, co-authors, Sarah Wallace Goodman and Tom Papitsky, um, any mistakes are are mine and not theirs, um, but we are co uh, full co-authors on this book. So I'm going to start um, by showing you this graph, which you may have seen a version of this in a variety of, of ways. This is the kind of cumulative U.S. death toll, death toll per capita um, over time from 2020 to 2022. You could expand you could expand this over time, but the what this is showing you is looking at um, the vote share for Trump in 2016, um, comparing different counties and their death rates. And so there's a couple of things to note. First is that these blue counties start off with much higher death rates from COVID than are, you know, what we would call red counties. These are more conservative counties. They tend to be more rural. We know that's the story of the early part of the pandemic. But as of the point where we get more vaccines um, and capability of people being vaccinated, we see this kind of shift on the death rates um, across different counties. And the most kind of Trump conservative counties are the ones where we see the highest death rates. And then we see this pulling apart where we're getting, you know, excess death in places that are more, we're more likely to vote for Donald Trump in 2016. Um, so this is just another way to see a similar kind of um, pattern if you look early on in the pandemic, it's April 2020, a lot of the early outbreaks of COVID and a lot of the deaths from COVID are coming in places like California and New York on the coast. This is where we're kind of moving from coast inward with, um, with COVID. Um, as you see um, more mitigation across places, we start to see these kind of excess deaths in Republican versus Democratic states. These aren't counties, either. these are states. Um, and these red lines being higher than the blue lines tell us that the excess death rates are higher in places that are more likely to vote Republican. Um, that kind of, when we get to vaccines, we see again this pulling apart of higher vaccination rates in places that are 
more likely to vote Democratic. And so the question might be, why, why is this? There's any number of explanations. But one of the explanations that we talk about in this book is the role of partisanship as an identity that shapes people's responses to the pandemic from very early days. And we, we show in the book as early as March of 2020, we're seeing lots of differences in health behaviors, both at the individual level and at policies across states that, that are wound up with partisanship. So we open the book by this little vignette looking at um, June of 2020. Uh, we are several months into the pandemic. There has been no um, this is a presidential year in case you forgot, right? This is all a blur, but um, in case you forgot, we were in the middle of primary election and then a general election in 2020. And um, the both the candidates, um, Biden and Trump are off the campaign trail in person for quite a long time, which is very unusual in a presidential year. In June of 2020, um, Trump goes back on the campaign trail and this is a picture of him in Tulsa, Oklahoma, at his first rally in person since the shutdowns in March. And you can see there's a couple of things to notice here. First, that um, it is in person where Joe Biden is still, as you know, Trump says, campaigning from his basement. He's wearing a mask everywhere he goes, even outdoors. Trump is indoors at a stadium in Tulsa. He has no mask. No one in the crowd seems to be masked, even the social, even the Secret Service folks. So this tells you that there's there's something about the way that um, Trump is acting that's quite different than Democratic leadership at this point. But it's as Mark pointed out, it's not only about Trump's messages; it's about broader messages about the pandemic that are coming from the parties that are quite different that that focus down into the public. The argument we make in this book is that partisanship is the most consistent predictors in U.S. health behaviors and attitudes in the COVID-19 pandemic. This partisan response is not in, was not inevitable. The partisan politics made the crisis worse. The effects of COVID-19 were all encompassing across. So mostly today we're going to talk about health behaviors, but we show in the book how um, COVID-19 also mattered for the, um, the election and for attitudes about democracy, attitudes about immigration and inequality. And it is not the case that all places that had conservative leaders were, um, were doing as poorly as the U.S., Okay, in the book we lay out what we call America's pre-existing conditions that would have made the pandemic difficult under any circumstances, and then point out how partisanship makes all of this worse. We are at a time of deep political polarization. Our healthcare system is is both weak and deeply unequal. We have economic and racial inequality that make health outcomes very different by income and race of people in the U.S. We are also in an election year with a president who was very focused on the economy. He saw, he saw it as the key to his reelection, um, a reelection that was going to be built on the Republican base and not reaching out across um, to many others. Um, we had also had multiple years of a bureaucracy, both, you know, not just the deep state bureaucracy, but a lot of the bureaucracy that had been underfunded, that was understaffed. And we had just come through an impeachment where the president um, believed that he had been kind of wrongly accused of, um, of wrongdoing and um, was, again, not very interested in kind of cooperating across party lines. And so into all of that walks coronavirus. So we have this, again, deeply unequal place, um, a place that does not have as much bureaucratic capacity as one might want for a huge pandemic. And then we have this unanticipated um, virus. In the very early days, we see the president downplaying the seriousness of the disease, um, the spatial heterogeneity of the pandemic, like I said, may, if you remember, the kind of earliest cases are in the coasts in states that were not key to the re-election of Donald Trump. Um, there's these kind of conflicts between the CDC and executive branch that in terms of messaging and when to shut down, whether to suggest that people are um, should stay home. 
And in this very noisy environment with low and conflicting information, the public starts to turn toward the people that they see as experts in this area, which is not only health experts, but now also their political experts, because the political experts are disagreeing with each other across party lines and also disagreeing with what health experts are telling them. Theoretically, we might expect that under conditions of, um, of a disease, a new disease, that people's risk aversion and self-interest would have led them to be more cautious, to pursue public health um, behaviors that would keep them protected. In fact, I wrote a whole book about anxiety and politics that suggests that that's what people should do under con conditions of threat. Um, but that's not exactly what we saw here. What we saw was instead what people did, instead of taking in information about their risk from disease and changing their attitudes and their behaviors accordingly, what we see is that people are taking their cues from their trusted political leaders instead of their health leaders. And when, and what we know from public opinion is when political elites are united, we should see the public follow along. But given that we saw elites across the parties um, divided on whether or not COVID was a risk at all, whether it could, you know, who was at risk and how to protect yourselves, what we saw was both division at the elite level that trickled down to the mass level and we saw um, division. So how do we, uh, in the book, look at this? Well, we did a series of surveys. Um, we started in March of 2020. Um, we, uh, my co-authors and I got a, a rapid grant from the National Science Foundation to fund a set of two surveys, and then we just kept applying for grants. And so we have a series of six surveys where we follow the same respondents from March of 2020 to March of 2021. We respond, we um, interview them six times. We start off with 3,000 people. We ask about, this is through YouGov, it's online, but weighted to match the census. We have questions about health behaviors, attitudes, emotions. Um, we also have a Russell Sage grant and other funding to, to do all this. So um, what I'm showing you here, this graph is just looking over time at the cumulative death rate. And then those gray bars, those vertical bars are the places where we have our surveys. So I'm gonna just give you a sense of the survey data, um, just focusing on health behaviors at this point. Um, so we asked a series of questions, and I'm sure Ash is going to talk more about how we measure health behaviors and attitudes, but we just asked these questions starting in March of 2020 and went over time about whether or not people are doing these activities to try and keep themselves safe from COVID. And this is just the percentages of respondents who said, yes, I am doing this thing, including visiting the doctor, getting information from COVID-19, washing your hands more. You can see lots of people are doing things like avoiding gatherings and washing their hands more. But again, we are arguing and we show as early as March of 2020 that you can see differences across people's partisanship in the, um, the behaviors that they are doing. So this is just looking at those same behaviors and looking by the identity of the respondent, whether they're Republican, Democrat, other here is independents who don't lean toward the parties. So across all of our measures, Democrats who are that middle gray bar are reporting much higher levels of these health mitigation measures than their um, than Republicans and Democrat the Republicans and independents. And this is just the the averages, but we can also look within the same state, we can compare within the same zip code. And even you know, facing the same kinds of health risks, we see these differences across. So you might say, well, in March of 2020, this is COVID is just a blue state problem. And so maybe it's just that people like Democrats are being rational, but Republicans are also being rational. And so that would be true. And so we, we look over time to see if it's the case that elites at some point come together um, and then we should see shifts where Republicans and Democrats look more like each other. Um, what we, in this time period that we're looking at, we would have required that, you know, Democrats and Republicans, again, have the same message in order for them to look similar. And that's not what we find. Um, in fact, what we see is it's these moves in parallel and polarization more than we see Republicans and Democrats starting to look like each other, even in the same states as the, the risk was similar. So again, this is slightly fuzzy. I don't expect you to read this over time, all of these little dots. But what this is showing you is 
the same six questions that I told you that we asked about washing hands, avoiding gatherings, looking at by by partisanship of the respondent over all six waves of the data that we have. And so again, the, the takeaway here is that these um, squares here, these gray squares that are on top, those are Democrats. Democrats always report that they are doing these things more, even at high levels where Republicans, many like 80% of Republicans that they're washing their hands more, 90% of Democrats are saying. So we have this, this difference and at no point do we see that the Republicans and Democrats are really coming together in, they either move in parallel or they're polarizing. Okay, so I'm just gonna show you, you may have noticed that we didn't ask about face masks in March because there was a lot of difference about uh, of opinion from the CDC and others about whether or not people should be wearing masks, whether you should leave them for healthcare workers. So we start to um, ask about masks in April, 2020, and then we ask about them over time. And it's an, a kind of, I think, helpful case study to see why this matters and how partisanship works here. So, you know, masking is a kind of major cultural shift in the United States. People like their individualism. They like their freedom. Um, they're less likely to be making decisions based on like what's good for the community. And very early on, President Trump is undercutting the message from public health officials about wearing a mask and telling people that it's wrapped up in the identity, your partisan identity about where you, why you wear a mask or not, right? So, and you know, he, he is in July, there's like one picture of him wearing a mask, but early on and later after that, he says, I'm, I'm not gonna do it. I don't think, you know, everyone can make their own choice, but I'm not going to do it. Um, you know, he, Trump himself gets COVID in October of 2020. He tells people in a tweet as he's leaving the hospital, don't be afraid of COVID, right? It's not a risk. I feel great. Um, and the first thing he does when he comes home from Walter Reed is go to the White House and take his mask off, even though it's likely that he is probably still contagious. So we see this in our, our data as well, right? So you ask people, have you worn a mask? Democrats and Republicans are very different. They're kind of different in terms of this is the percentages of Democrats and Republicans who say they're wearing a mask over time. Democrats are always higher. And it kind of, you know, it becomes a marker of identity in ways that makes it very difficult to change that behavior when people and, and getting people to take in information about whether or not it is a risk or not to, um, to, not to wear a mask, but to not wear a mask. When it gets wrapped up in identity, like we think these health behaviors do, they're very hard to separate um, from what is good for you from what is you, okay? So again, this is just where we're gonna stop again. How did we get here where the deaths themselves are partisan? Well, we saw this as early as March of 2020 in that the all of the behaviors were partisan and the um, elites, uh, dividing on that um, are is a kind of indication of what we would what we saw for that first year of the pandemic. That was fantastic. I mean, I'm continually reminded. There's a lot I learned from this book, but I'm also continually reminded of just how compressed and intense that period was. And I think no one feels that intensity as much as somebody who's a journalist covering it day to day. So I want to turn it over to Apoorva for some thoughts and perspective. Thank you. Yeah, as I was listening to Shana talk, I was having some PTSD of covering a year of um, lies from the White House, which is an unprecedented situation for a health reporter to be in to have to fact check the administration on an active basis. Um, but, you know, I do want to uh, talk a little bit beyond that. I mean, I come from the perspective of an infectious disease reporter. You know, I wrote about the first SARS um, outbreak. I've covered malaria, HIV, TB. And, you know, I live in a world where people expected a pandemic to happen. And so there were lots of what we call tabletop exercises, trying to model what might happen if a virus like the coronavirus came along. And in fact, the year before the pandemic, um, this organization, the Global Health Security Council, they sort of, it's an it's a international consortium of experts rated all of the countries of the world in how they could deal with a pandemic. And they ranked the United States number one in pretty much every category, except communication in which they ranked second after the United Kingdom. But essentially they thought that the US would do a fantastic job because 
we have all the resources, we have all the money and the, the expertise and the knowledge. Um, I think they really did not take into account the kind of partisanship that Shane has been talking about and came as a huge shock to just about every expert I talked to. You know, they, everybody was, of course, aware of the anti-vax movement and um, just of the sort of divide, and especially after the 2016 election of the sort of partisanship that exists um, in this country and could be a problem, but I don't think anybody expected the uh, the extent of how this would play out. And, um, you know, Shane talked a lot about uh, Trump, and there's no doubt that if we had had a different president in power, things would have been very different. But um, I, I also don't think it stops there. I think th a lot of it was already in place even before he arrived. You know, we heard, for example, after the 2016 election that he was a, a symptom, not the cause. It, it is a little bit like that. And uh, you know, in in writing about the pandemic since then, in writing about you know what went wrong and how we cope with pandemics in this country, what's become really clear is that there are some things that are baked into the United States of America, baked into how we are structured that make it next to impossible to fight a pandemic. So you know, I think you mentioned federalism, Mark, when you were um, giving your introduction, and that's a huge part of it. You know, it's a big strength of the United States that we have this much diversity. Um, and there are some very good reasons for why certain states make the choices they do. You know, in, in health, for example, if you have a small state like Vermont or Alaska, they may not want to share the, their health data because it makes people really easily identifiable. So there are reasons for why there are blockades in place. But what it does mean is that when you have a pandemic, this, the government just can't move as fast as it needs to. They don't have access to information. They don't have access to all of the records. They don't know what's happening, um, even with doctors. And there's a, also a massive divide between what we call you know, public health, community health, and medicine in this country because we don't have a national health care system. Pretty much all of our medical care is privatized. And so there's not a lot of communication between the government structures that respond to a pandemic and the medical establishment that actually sees the patients with the disease. And all of those things played into this pandemic. So yes, partisanship, but also all of these um, other things. And I think now, you know, delving into sort of disinformation and misinformation, looking at it, it, it's startling how much, how far we've come and whether we'll ever be able to turn back. Uh, my colleagues actually published a story a couple of weeks ago, um, sort of tracing the path of, of misinformation. And, you know, they said uh, on July 8th, President Trump went on Truth Social and he said that he won the um, election in Wisconsin. 8,000 people saw it on Truth Social. But then it went on to all these other social media platforms, you know, Parler, Gab, um, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, you name it. And within 48 hours, a million people had seen it. And then, of course, then you have talk radio, you have podcasts, you have TV. And before you know it, a very significant chunk of the country believes that he did win the election in Wisconsin. And we're seeing something very similar play out even with health. So, you know, when monkeypox came along, it became really obvious that this is not COVID specific. This is now actually baked into how we look at infectious diseases, how we might react to any pandemic that comes along. Uh, almost immediately, there was misinformation, you know, on, on social media. I anecdotally saw tons of people saying, oh, look, you're done fear mongering about COVID. So now you're going to use monkeypox to control us. And what's next? Lockdowns for monkeypox, et cetera. Um, and actually, there was this team of researchers at the University of Alberta who scraped TikTok, which you know has a billion monthly users, and in May, before monkeypox was even really a big thing in the United States, they scraped 800 videos with misinformation in one day. So we are just looking at a completely different landscape than we were, you know, five years ago. And I think that has to play into every single pandemic plan we put into place. And you know, I have a feeling that if Shana wrote another book after the next pandemic, it would not be all that different, probably would be much worse. Um, last week, there was a Pew Research Center poll that said that 70% of Republicans think that scientists should stay out of public policy decisions. And Democrats, the numbers were almost exactly flipped. 66% of Democrats thought that scientists should play a very active role in public policy decisions. So I think we are at a place where we have a very divided country, and I'm not sure where we go from here. Thank you, Apoorva. And of course, all of that will also apply to climate and a host of other issues that, 
that we're facing. Abortion, all kinds of things, yeah. Yeah, Ashley. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here with you today and share some of what we at KFF have learned about politics and COVID through our own public opinion research. So KFF has been conducting regular surveys of the US public on healthcare and health policy for over 20 years. And normally we focus a lot about healthcare affordability and access. And as you can imagine, as a survey researcher who regularly asks the public about their views of health policy, I'm well versed on partisanship and its impact on the public's attitudes and reported experiences. But I think it's especially important and what this book does is to think about how the party, these partisan divides in public health play out with this unprecedented effort and an unprecedented pandemic and uh, effort to vaccinate Americans against COVID. Um, in late 2020, um, like uh, other survey researchers, my organization launched a big effort to track the public's views and experiences with vaccinations through our COVID-19 vaccine monitor. The monitor, it's still active, is a nationally representative survey run by my team to Initially, it was used to track vaccine uptake and hesitancy and is now tracking everything from booster uptake to vaccinations among kids and, as Apuro mentioned, the prevalence of misinformation. Similar to others reading this book, it was a little triggering for me um, because it reminded me of such pivotal moments during the pandemic, and Shana alluded to some of them, but, you know, what's the so influential was the early and consistent rhetoric from President Trump. As early as 20, January 2020, um, the former president was saying things like, it's under control, it's gonna be fine. By February, he was blaming Democrats for politicizing the virus and perpetuating a hoax. Um, his tone was really consistent throughout his term, right? That churches were gonna be full by Easter, we're gonna get back to normal, it's going to disappear. And given this early messaging from President Trump, it's perhaps not surprising that the response by the, to the pandemic was characterized by at least some partisan divide from the start. But across a variety of measures, as Shana mentioned, um, we saw those trends and the gaps getting larger over time. And so I'm thinking back to spring 2020 when we were thinking, we were asking the public how worried they were about getting sick from COVID-19. We saw only a slight gap between Democrats and Republicans. It was 11 percentage points. 56% said of, of Democrats said they were worried compared to 45% of Republicans. By October of that same year, just a few months um, before the vaccines were becoming available, that gap had ballooned to more than 40 percentage points, so more than tripled. And by November 2021, we saw Democrats about twice as likely as Republicans to say they're worried about someone in their family getting sick from COVID. And our own data, I'm just going to add a little bit of our own data to continue the narrative where the data in the book kind of ends. Um, by April 2021, um, Democrats were already outpacing Republicans on vaccine uptake. And now um, it's about nine in 10 Democrats have reported getting at least one shot compared to about just half, a little bit more than half of Republicans. Um, these differences are magnified when it comes to boosters. Our latest survey finds that about three fourths of Democrats compared to one fourth of Republicans report being both vaccinated and boosted. That means that Democrats are almost, what is that, three times as likely as Republicans to be up to date with vaccinations according to the CDC guidelines. And I should note that, you know, partisanship is not the only thing that predicts whether someone will get a COVID-19 vaccine. In fact, when we developed our measure, um, our question measuring vaccine uptake, we designed it in order to measure both uptake, hesitancy, and resistance. So we asked people whether they would get vaccinated as soon as possible, whether they wanted to wait and see, whether they would only get vaccinated if required, or if they would definitely not get vaccinated. And if you remember back to when the vaccines were first available, there was a considerable share of adults who were in that wait and see group. Um, this was especially true among Black and Hispanic adults who had legitimate questions and concerns about the safety of the vaccines. Um, this may stem from distrust in the medical system or that the vaccines were developed something, uh, use something called Operation Warp Speed, which um, was a little alarming to some people. By, but by the end of the summer, we found that those populations had become less, less vaccine hesitant. They saw friends and family members get vaccinated. They talked to a healthcare provider. Um, they, their concerns dissipated. What we didn't see shift was the share of Republicans in that definitely not category, right? So they were, they were not vaccine hesitant, they were vaccine resistant. 
So yes, vaccine uptake is driven by demographic differences like age, education, race, ethnicity, geography. But when we, you know, like the good political scientist that I am, enter all of those into a multivariate model, we find that partisanship turned out to be the strongest predictor of any of the other demo, uh, demographic variables in, um, in vaccine uptake and now booster uptake as well. Um, I would just want to add a little bit to what Apoorva has talked about, about misinformation um, before we get to the conversation. And I, it's something that we are paying a lot of attention to. In several of our surveys, we've been um, testing people's beliefs in different false or misleading statements around the safety of vaccines and the risk of COVID. Um, for almost every piece of misinformation that we're looking at, Republicans are substantially more likely to believe it compared to Democrats. This includes the false belief that vaccines can cause infertility, change their, your DNA, and that COVID is not really that deadly and the government is inflating the number of deaths. Um, in fact, we find a, such a strong correlation between belief in this type of misinformation and being unvaccinated. So it's a lesson for all of us going forward, um, figuring out how to do a better job of countering misinformation early on during a public health emergency and trying to do a better job of understanding the role that partisanship may be playing and in belief information and misinformation and disinformation. And I think with that, I'll stop and let us get to the conversation and I'm looking forward to it. Great, thank you very much, Ashley. Um, first, I wanna apologize. I think I identified you, Ashley, as being affiliated with Kaiser Health News, which we're familiar with because they're right around the corner from us, but you're with Kaiser Family Foundation. It's all one organization. We're I, right. I, 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 that's what I figured. Um, Shana, do you want to comment on any comment no, on? I mean, I, I think this um, is really the the focus on misinformation is not one that we take up very much in the book, but I do think that's a huge part of the story, and that um, some of my colleagues in communication do a really good job thinking about um, about. You know, I hadn't thought much about TikTok. I, I prefer not to think about TikTok if possible. But um, but I do think, you know, the smart, you know, people who are are working on social media platforms um are really important here. Um I also think I I love that I'm just like a super fan of the Kaiser Family Foundation and the polling. And so I'm so happy to hear about you know that they're still thinking and and asking about boosters and and kids vaccines. And one of the things that um I think maybe we we can talk about is that the um the uptake of kids vaccines is very low, um, especially for kids under the age of five. Um, and that I don't think that is only explainable by partisanship because it's much lower than you would expect given the um, uh, kind of the breakdown of partisanship in the in the US. And so I think one of the things we might want to think about in terms of vaccination or other things is um, why that is, why it's why we're seeing these very low levels of booster uptake children's vaccines and and how much of that is about a lack of communication from the CDC and other and kind of local health agencies and how much of that is like people just wanting to believe that this is over. And I don't know if either one of you have a sense of, of that. Yeah, I mean, definitely, I think a lot of people want to believe that it's over. Um, and I also do think that the government did not take all the opportunities that it could have to get the message across on vaccines. Um, Ashley, you mentioned that you know they didn't uh, talk about this early enough in the pandemic, but I think they didn't talk about it early enough in the, te the technologies development. I mean, you know, mRNA vaccines were being developed for 20 years at the NIH, and there were a lot of opportunities that were missed to be able to say, this is actually your tax dollars that work. This is not new technology. This is, you know, you put money into this. This is your doing, and you should benefit from it. And, you know, we are not the only country that saw vaccine hesitancy. There was a lot of vaccine hesitancy in Germany and in other countries. But what they did differently was they sort of did very targeted campaigns. They had they figured out who the people trusted and they put those people in front and they had them say, you know, you this is the medical benefit for you from, you know, getting a vaccine and you shouldn't uh, not get it for these other reasons. Here's some information. And 
I think it's important to reach people where they are, you know, whether that's religious leaders, whether that's community leaders, uh, you know, about 70 million people are members of social media platforms like, you know, Parler and Gab and Truth Social that um, build themselves as, you know, alternatives to the, the usual, you know, the big Facebook, Twitter platforms. And so that's, those are the places that information needs to go. But if you look at the CDC or the FDA, you know, one of my big criticisms during the pandemic was that I could barely get information out of them, you know, and I work for the New York Times. It, it was kind of insane to me that I, how hard I had to work to get the most basic information out of them. And I was getting emails from tons and tons of readers saying, I'm going to a wedding, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, How you know, how can I be safe? And there was no place for those people to go. There was no place for people to be able to go ask very simple questions. There were autobots for a lot of these social media accounts from government agencies. And even when there were people, it was so st stiff and stilted and not interactive, not responsive that, you know, people didn't have anywhere to go. And I think we can't do things like that again. It has to be so much more easy to get information for everybody, not just for reporters. Apoorva, how much of that was a function of the Trump era CDC, you know, that, that's kind of changed a bit and how much is it just the nature of a, an agency that's not actually very good at interfacing with the public? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it was definitely a different kind of secrecy during the Trump era. There was a lot of active obfuscation and lying and, and doctoring of documents. That's not always the case, but I will say the CDC is almost always secretive. This is not new. I mean, they are really, really not great at communicating um, with people, which is such a shame, right? When you think about it, so much could have been improved by letting reporters actually behind the scenes saying, this is what we do. Look, this is who we are. Because the individual CDC scientists I know are, for the most part, amazing. They are so hardworking. They mean so well. And instead of showing us what they did, they did. They had this sort of faceless institution that didn't seem to care about the average person. And that, I think, really worked against all of us. Let me just put some numbers to the, the children vaccination, because I think it's it's really striking. So when we first started tracking this among adults, we had about one in five adults that were in that definitely not category. And that's actually where vaccination, when we ask parents about vaccinating their kids, that's where most, the, like that's about the share for um, parents said about their kids too. And what we saw is as there was lack of information, the rollout of vaccinating, for, especially for the youngest kiddos was really tough. We saw that number increase and now it's about half of parents of kids less than five say that they definitely will not get their um, their youngest kiddos vaccinated. I think that's really striking to show, you know, um, where vaccine hesitancy was and where it increased to because of the rollout and the confusion. And when we asked them, you know, why, why don't you want to get your kids vaccinated? They talk about lack of research. They talk about the, the vaccines are too new. They're not tested enough. They're worried about side effects. So all of the same concerns that existed for adults too, but that then we we're able to address using public health messaging, it hasn't been effective, especially among those youngest um, um, six months to uh, five under five. So I think it's really striking. You know, what? if I can add to that for a second, it's also, I think that the, the, the CDC and other agencies didn't really talk about the importance of getting vaccinated, even if you were infected. By the time the vaccines came for kids, just about everybody was infected already. And people already had this perception of kids as not being at high risk. And I don't think that the messaging was nuanced enough to be able to say, yeah, I know we got you got infected already, but here's why you might still need a booster. I think it was just all, no, get vaccinated, get vaccinated. And there was no subtlety about that message. So people just turned away from it because they, they didn't hear themselves in it. I was infected, why should I still get one? They didn't hear a satisfactory response to that. What's the relationship, uh, Ashley, you might have a sense of this from your surveys or, or, or Shana, between the overall movement of vaccine hesitancy about kids, which has been going on for like 20 years now, and the specific hesitancy about COVID? I mean, are either one driving the other or, you know, or is the bigger one irrelevant? So I, I think, but maybe Ashley can speak to this about the numbers. My sense from reading the literature on, on kids vaccination and Jennifer Reich's work on um, childhood um, vaccines is that um, it's a pretty small number of parents who don't vaccinate broadly. Um, they have their reasons, and um, but 
schools are such a mechanism to to basically get kids vaccinated because every there are very few exceptions in very in a handful of states that would allow you to be fully unvaccinated um, to go to schools. And so I think the COVID nine I think there is this anti vax movement that has spread and has spread misinformation through COVID-19. But I think this, this hesitancy about the COVID-19 vaccines is, is something bigger than a general anti-vax movement because there's no school that requires you to have it to be there. So there's no state mechanism to actually force parents at this point. There's just recommendations. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. And, you know, going back to the role that partisanship is playing in this, what we're finding is, you know, um, this increased distrust in science um, that came along during the pandemic, especially among Republicans, um, has led these parents to call into question the legitimacy of other vaccines in a way that we hadn't seen prior to the pandemic that, that could be um, quite troubling. Yes, there are mechanisms in schools that, you know, that, that get kids vaccinated, but um, this overall mistrust and distrust in science, I think, could play out in lots of different ways, you know, um, taking their um, child to the doctor, to see a healthcare provider, to um, take the healthcare provider's advice on um, on medications, you know, all of that could be playing out in, the, that, in a way that we hadn't seen prior to the pandemic. We have some questions from the audience, but before we go to that, I, I want to loop back a little bit because I was really struck that um, both of you, Ashley and Apoorva, used the words misinformation and disinformation, and Shana, you really didn't. And I, I want to just like dig into that a little bit more because I'm really, I'm sort of hesitant, beginning to hesitate myself about using, you know, glibly using words mis and disinformation. And I wonder if if we can disaggregate a little bit you know, misinformation, legitimate uncertainty, and maybe, you know, there's kind of cultivated uncertainty. There's people, you know, the, sower, the sowers of doubt theory that like about, like about election denial, you know, which supports, you know, can support and spread misinformation. And obviously I'm probably a little influenced by having read this morning, Emily Oster's piece about how, you know, we should sort of have a general amnesty for everybody who screwed up. <laughs> um, and I, it, which has infuriated a lot of people. I'm not sure I, I wasn't quite as infuriated about the piece, but I wonder if you could think about, um, you know, not just misinformation, but actual or cultivated uncertainty as institutions try to grapple with this. I mean, I think that's what's new in what we're facing now. You know, we, before I joined the Times, I ran an autism news website. So I was very familiar with the kind of anti-vax messaging you see among parents. And a lot of that is what we would call misinformation. People who are anxious for various reasons and have just heard the wrong information want to do the right thing, but genuinely believe that giving the vaccines to their kids is going to harm them in some way. That I think has existed for quite a while now since, you know, Andrew Wakefield in the late 80s. But the the kind of thing that we're seeing now where, you know, respected figures, respected figures in the community are actively spreading information or previously respected figures, I should say. Some of them have genuinely swallowed the misinformation themselves and they also think that they're doing the right thing. But then there is a whole segment now of disinformation, information that is actively maliciously being placed to cause harm. And I think that is a new beast that, you know, it's, it's, it, was, it was there before, but now it's a huge monster and we're not, we're not really sure how to get rid of that. Uh, I'm gonna take a slightly different, um, posi not different position, like a slightly different angle, which is um, that I worry, I, I don't think disinformation is something to scoff at. I worry a lot more that most people pay little attention most of the time um, and that for them, any amount of information might be helpful, and but that we don't have a great way to think about both general uncertainty, as Mark said, but also statistical uncertainty, right? And so I think that is, so when people start to think about like, what is the risk from taking a vaccine or from masking versus not, right? We don't have a great way to explain to people how they should think about counterfactuals. We don't have a great way to think about statistical uncertainty and what it means that sometimes you're going to get the vaccine and you're still going to get COVID. Um, and so I think the kind of, there's a general 
discomfort that people have with the way that we have to think in these these terms of that confidence intervals and thinking about uncertainty and that um that is more my concern and that's partially why we, and we also in the book we don't talk very much about misinformation or disinformation because there's lots of really smart people doing that work but also because so much of politics is like not paying any attention and then be having like being forced to pay attention and then thinking about how do we grapple with this this information that we don't know what to do with so that's that's kind of my slightly different angle on this yeah. i think it's a, a good insight about politics in general like a lot of it is about how you manage attention and the fact that most people are not you know so we often look at politics in terms of people having certain beliefs but it it's often more a matter of what they're paying attention to when, which is often very little. Um, really interesting. Ashley, did you? Well, I was just gonna, you know, adding on to that is like, as, as Shane started with, right? Like they were taking their um, their cues from political leaders, right? And, um, and thinking about political leaders passing on disinformation to the public and how really troubling that can that can be for you know our democracy in terms of elections or in public health emergencies and so um i'm, I'm thinking about the role of politicians in perpetuating disinformation and misinformation if if we can't you know we can't put the burden entirely on the public you know there we have working moms and dads and you know people just trying to get by and you know they they're not supposed to be the experts they're supposed to be able to trust their their leaders and so thinking about um what how we can do a better job of making sure politicians are are sharing um factual information so i mean this is really playing out in the midterms right now right the, the leading up to that you know you see dr oz spouting misinformation or disinformation or however we want to categorize that i don't know his intentions but uh, you know, the, the Democrats, the Democratic candidates are not really countering it with information. The best way to counter mis or disinformation, right, is with good information to be able to point out what's wrong. And and I think most of the Democratic candidates right now are, don't want to bring up COVID, don't want to talk about the pandemic. So there's not no counter to these myths. That's actually the first uh, question from the audience. So let me just uh, do that, which is to which is about the midterms. And question is many people are still experiencing the aftermath of the inequalities created by COVID and the response yet COVID seems to be far from voters minds in the midterm election why is that I'm, I'm not sure it is actually but that's the that's the question I mean I would say I think it is you know you considering that we are coming up to a point where there is going to be most likely a winter wave we don't know how big but there probably will be one and we have influenza and RSV and everything else you would expect the government to be talking more about COVID and they're not really. I mean, we had President Biden say in September that the pandemic is over, which, you know, they walked back later, but basically that seems to be the approach. I think they're afraid to talk about the pandemic. It seems like nobody wants to touch it with a 10 foot pole. I mean, if you just ask voters, you know, what they're thinking about, right, that, um, you know, COVID is not in the top five, right? I mean, it's the economy, it's inflation, it's um, I think even maybe Ukraine might be above the, the pandemic at this point. And that's partially because the right the people in charge don't want to talk about it. It's that right, one, you don't want to get blamed for mismanagement. Um, and two, you're not getting very much credit for it at this point. Um, and you also want to be like, don't look at the fact that 800 people a day are still dying, right? Like there's there, you know, it's a fine line. Um, and they, you know, Biden wants to talk about what he thinks is gonna help. The Democrats who are running, and and it's and they made a calculation that it's not COVID at this point. No, I think it's pretty clear that they made the calculation that um, the Supreme Court overturning Roe was going to be a more winning issue for um, Democratic candidates than talking about COVID. I think even I think climate change is even above COVID in terms of voters' top issues, which I think is really striking because that it that climate change rarely comes up in the top top um, issues. So yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Um, but Shana, as somebody who's written a book about anxiety and politics, I wonder how, like, I often have the, I have a little bit of a theory that sometimes kind of traumatic events kind of affect voters, you know, years on, as they do people in our, in our lives. So I, like, I think part of the story behind Trump was just the trauma of the financial crisis that recession the really long-term unemployment that ensued that's just a theory in my head because obviously 
it was finally over by then. Do you think there's any kind of underlying, you know, the, this experience of having your kids out of school, you know, all the all the disruption of, of COVID, even if it doesn't show up in polls as the most important issue? So I think that's that's very true, right? I think that there's echo, there's going to be echoes in COVID about COVID and the whole experience, right? Because it's not just about the disease. It's about all the, like you said, the disruption. It's about the educational effects. It's about that there's a million, more than a million less people now than there were in 2020. And that's over and above what we expect. The lifespan of many of our um, you know, groups in the United States is dropped right native the lifespan of native americans has dropped by six years and since 2020 i mean there are absolutely going to be after effects um the kind of undercutting of democratic norms and uh, and the election that's all part and parcel of this moment in time that's not just about the pandemic but it's all wrapped up in it whether or not people actually ascribe it that that that, that to the pandemic i think would take some work from from elites. Um, I'm not sure that people necessarily know like the long tail of, of the effects, but they're certainly going to be felt. Um, but they may think, oh, it's just about inflation because, you know, elites talk, you know, political leaders talk in two-year increments and four-year increments, but like the effects of public policy are, are long, right? Just think about the last time you went to an airport and had to take your shoes off. Right. Like that's a 20 year tail from one of, you know, from an event in time. So there there are long tails from events, although I think voters don't always ascribe that to particular events unless kind of politicians make that connection for them. You know, we just wrapped up a big survey with CNN and um, looking at mental health. And I think the mental health impacts of the pandemic are going to be long lasting, and especially among um, young adults, um, you know, the, the groups, 18 to 29 year olds that were really informative ages during uh, this pandemic. I think it's going to be really troubling to watch the share of them that suffer from anxiety and depression and, and don't have the resources to access care. Um, but they don't really even attribute it to the pandemic. They, they, you know, it's, it's much bigger than that for them. They kind of think of the pandemic as an isolated event and not really thinking about the long lasting impacts of it. One thing I'm really curious about is how the perception of the pandemic will change over time as some of these longer term effects become apparent. You know, if you hear a lot of the rhetoric around learning loss, it's just the pandemic wasn't actually as big a deal. We did a lot of harm in trying to counter this little thing that could have been fine. And over time, as more people, you know, are diagnosed with having long COVID, you know, a lot of the people who have long COVID now, hopefully it'll resolve. But even if it's a very small percent that continue to have long-term problems, that will be a significant number of people. And everyone will probably know somebody with debilitating symptoms. And I wonder, you know, once the the sort of partisan rhetoric is behind them and the anger and the, you know, the sort of the instant instinctive sort of survival mode, um, how much people will look back and realize, you know what, that actually was pretty terrible. A lot of people I knew died. A lot of people I know have long COVID and how that might change the perception long-term. Although plenty of us who, well, never mind. I'm, I'm gonna go to another another question from the, uh, <laughs> from the audience, um, which is what lessons can we learn to help the country better navigate the next global national threat? What systems in place do we need to have to ensure safety? No, that's not quite any of your focus, but I'm curious what. I mean, partly, I suppose, mine, but yeah. um, I, don't, I just don't think I have any answers. You know, I, I wrote about this really recently, actually, what why we may not be able to do so well with handling pandemics and what we need to change. And of course, money is a big part of it. We need to fund public health in a big way. We need better data systems. We need more coordination between federal and state. But some of those things, as we were talking about earlier, are baked into the country. And unless there are some real legal changes, it's not clear that those are going to go away. And in terms of just countering, you know, getting ahead of the misinformation, I think we've, we've been talking here about how to get, you know, do it early and do it often and do it clearly. If a pandemic wasn't going to, isn't going to make the public support more funding for public health, I don't know what will, right? And, and we haven't seen that to be the case. It doesn't seem like one of the lessons learned among the public or even among politicians is, is more financial support for a public health system. So unfortunately, I don't have any answers either. 
But Porva, you were talking earlier, I think you alluded to the kind of a disconnect between public health and doctors who are working with patients. Is there something there that you that suggests a, a solution? There, there might be. I mean, so one of the things that has happened is, you know, doctors are the ones who on the front lines, they see the patients, they know when there's a new virus coming along with some cluster of cases. And the, the lines of communication between medicine and public health are just not very clear. Like you, you, there's not a good way for the CDC to know when doctors are starting to see this. You know, there's steps that have to happen in between. So if we had a sort of better data systems that are connected, if we, for example, um, made it sort of mandatory for hospitals to report data into public health agencies in return for say, you know, Medicaid or whatever. It's some, if you receive Medicaid dollars, you must contribute data. That kind of sort of legal binding agreements, then maybe we would see better data flow and we might be able to respond a little faster. So that's one potential solution, uh, you know, and I think also as electronic medical records get better, they're just a mess right now. They're a huge, huge mess. Uh, but the ones, that, the ones that we have start to look similar and we work out the bugs and figure out, you know, how they can communicate with each other, there will be better data, hopefully. I'm going to make a completely self-serving recommendation, which, is, which we do in the book as well, which is that social scientists should be part of the discussion about pandemics and, and public health. And there was just not as much engagement on the government side to people who work in areas of social science and humanities, right? It's very much like the doctors and the public health folks and not the sociologists and the political scientists and um, the folks who are kind of understand decision theory and understand how people think about issues and consider them. And it, I don't think the social scientists are gonna fix this entirely, but I do think that there's there needs to be more places of discussion and thinking about, you know, a lot of my colleagues wrote these kind of op-eds in science and in JAMA about like, here's the messages that we know might be most effective. Um, and like, I just don't know how much uptake there was on the government side from that, right? Like, I think a lot of us were kind of like shouting about this, but I'm not sure how much engagement there was from kind of formal, formal, you know, institutions of, of folks who do work in social sciences. Yeah, 100% agree. Actually, in the CDC, there are people, there are economists, social scientists, behavioral psychologists, the kinds of people you would need to make a sort of more holistic uh, decision about things. And my understanding from the reporting I've done is that even though those people exist, they were often not in the room. They they were not actually being asked for specific things. And I think that's why we saw a lot of the, this is based on science kind of language when really was based appropriately on science, but also on some other economic considerations and all of those things. And if they had said, look, we considered the science, but we also looked at this economics of it. We looked at the social science. We looked at the psychology, blah, blah, blah. We had all these people put their input in, and this is where we've arrived as the best thing for our country. That would have gone over a lot better than this is all based on science when it's not. I guess I don't even know what people mean when they they say like that tr they trust in science or not. Like I, I use those questions, but I'm not sure what people are thinking about like when they're thinking I mean, Ashley, do you have a sense from either kind of open-ended or qualitative? Like, what are people thinking about? Is it like guy in a white jacket with a beaker? Yeah. Is that like exactly, know? exactly? I mean, that that's and the, you know, I alluded to this like Operation Warp Speed, right? They're thinking about like you know labs and secrecy and you know all of all of that when they're talking about like science and and we all know that science is in companies encompasses much more than that right it involves economists social scientists um you know behavioral scientists as well as those that are they actually you know conducting physical lab experiments yeah, that's a really uh, a really persuasive point. I'm sorry I dropped off there for a minute. Um, uh, another question from the audience, uh, which I'm going to restate a little bit. COVID forced people to pay attention to state and local governments. Did this have any notable effects? Were views towards state and local government just as polarized? And I wonder if you can comment a little bit on, I mean, I feel like as we went through the experience, we saw different states highlight, you know, some states would seem good and then they, then they would, you know, there were obviously the Cuomo, Andrew Cuomo press conferences and all that. There was Ohio seemed different from Florida. You know, they kind of popped up and down. 
how did how do, how should we see that in retrospect? The role of state and government and attitudes towards state and local government, which are traditionally more trusted than the federal government. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, in a federal system in the way, you know, as of course, as the way our, our health systems are set up, they're both private, but also they're at the state level, right? And then all of the regulation on, on health, or almost all the regulation on health is, is at the state level. States decide whether they're going to take, you know, they're going to expand for the Affordable Care Act and whether they're going to sign up for Medicaid expansion. And so there's so much variation by states, which also lines up on partisanship of the state. But, you know, those state level decisions are really important in helping to structure health more broadly. And they have this big impact on um, lifespan and access to healthcare and access to drug treatment and all sorts of things. My colleague in sociology, Jennifer Carez Montes, does really fabulous work looking at state legislatures and health outcomes. Um, I think generally in our data, we find that the kind of health like the local leaders are seen, like you said, as more trustworthy. Um, I think the difficulty on the state level is just the lack of information that people have, right? The lack of local newspaper, local newspapers are, are dying. Um, a lot of the local television stations are owned by the same national companies. Um, and so you get kind of a, a national message rather than these more, you know, these as more than you get kind of the tailored state and local kinds of information. So I think, I mean, I'm, I don't have much to say about the performance of the states as much as that people, I think, trust their state health agencies more, um, but they don't have as much access to information about what they're doing or how to get information about them because lo local newspapers are hard to find. And also like state agencies have terrible websites generally. Yeah, just adding on to that, absolutely. We find the same thing in our data that um, the public is, um, um, is more likely to trust their local health agencies. They're more, li most li more likely to put faith in local leaders. Um, but if you really want to see the way that partisanship played out in this is Democrats living in Republican led states and how angry they became when mask mandates got lifted or um, any of those requirements got lifted or on the flip side, Republicans living in Democrat um, led areas and ha still having masks um, in, in place. And so um, you could really see the partisanship playing out in the data in that way as well. We saw a lot of this play out with schools, especially right locals and school districts going a certain way and then the people of that district rebelling or the states deciding to sue them or pass a law saying, no, you can't do that. I mean, it was there was so much conflict at every level, which was just incredibly confusing to people. Do you listen to your local leader? Do you listen to your governor? Do you listen to the president? Do you listen to the CDC? Uh, you know, one CDC official I talked to recently said, it's not just the lack of information, right? At times there was also too much information. Like the, some of their guidance was so detailed. Like if you looked at um, some of the guidance for schools, it was like a school superintendent was supposed to be able to interpret this incredibly complicated information. And this official basically said, you know, I think we we did a bad job. We we gave way too much information. We should have give you know we gave it at the level of like what a doctor would need to know instead of what the average person would need to know. That's really interesting to know. And there's also a good reminder, like the the section on federalism in the book is really valuable. Interplaying with, I mean, we've we've looked a little bit at um, preemption of local initiatives across a lot of areas. Really interesting, you know, state preempting labor laws, LGBT protections, environmental uh, uh, laws that, that local communities have have passed. As a like, that's a real undercurrent right now of American politics, and also played a role in um, in in COVID response and in the in the schools. Um, I mean, it's also playing a role now, you know, with the overturning of Roe is now with a, a abortion policy being set on a, a state level. And so I think we're seeing that play out in, in a way that, um, you know, people living in states where abortion is no, long, no longer legal and while their neighbors across the county lines and living in a different state have access to abortion and play. I, th I think it's gonna be really interesting to see how, you know, when we have all these health decisions being made at, um, at the non-federal level, how it all plays out and for the people living in these different states. Yeah, including how do people who live in states where the abortion rights have not changed, you know, react to the changes in other states. Yeah, exactly. Um, cool. 
it's a pretty broad question, but I think we can put it on the table. How has the pandemic shifted the way people view the role of health and government institutions and service delivery? I mean, I guess, again, to restate it a little bit, is there anything that's happened that changes, permanently changes the relationship with those institutions in either a good or bad way? So much more mistrust, so much less confidence. I mean, I think we're, we're going to see that reverberate for a really long time. You know, I've never reported on something where people mistrusted the CDC to this extent. And I count myself among those people. You know, even reporters, I think, are really wary of what comes out of these federal agencies now. It's just a very different environment. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a, um, I had a project where I was looking at you can trust in different federal agencies and the CDC always ranked pretty high. It was like a, it was a kind of well-respected agency. Now we might wonder like, what does it matter if the public trusts the CDC? Well, like you, you, you need the public to, to understand that what they're being asked to do and comply with that. Right. Um, and so um, the CDC was ranked pretty high, but like, you can see like it had, like it's just cratered and that that's how agencies start to rebuild that. I mean, I think the Biden administration has tried. I'm not sure they've been particularly successful with this, this new team um, at the CDC. Um, so I think that is one of those things is that like the agencies that deal with health were always the ones that people turn to, particularly in a crisis. And then now it's you know, if you can't trust what government is telling you, where are you going to turn? You're going to turn to alternative sources, which are much less regulated. They're much less more likely to have misinformation, as we've talked about. Um, and so that's a that's a real problem. You may be, you know, you may not know how to kind of uh, weigh risks versus benefits. Um, and so I think that's that's a long term problem and the agencies have to think about how they maybe are more transparent. Maybe they're, you know, thinking about um, doing town halls or something like I kind of laugh at the idea that like the CDC coming to do a town hall, but it's like probably not a bad idea to try and like work with people where they are. They need I something, right? I mean, one of the big, sorry, um, one of the big problems I think has been that, you know, CDC, CDC is in Atlanta and they were always seen as sort of separate from White House politics. And that really worked to their advantage because it's like, okay, this is about public health. It's not about politics. And one of the things they have not done yet is to separate that you know, Dr. Walensky is still part of the White House briefings, it's still sort of all mixed up in there, and it doesn't look as separate as it needs to. And the CDC still isn't doing as many briefings of its own as it used to. And so it's just, you know, until we separate those, there's no Republican that's going to watch a White House uh, briefing, you know, and, and say, okay, I believe everything coming out of that briefing. I think if they really want everybody to listen to what the CDC has to say, the CDC has to say it, not just the White House and the CDC mix up. I love it when I can just bring the data points to to further back up everyone's point. So we actually asked how much trust um, people had in the CDC in April 2020, and the share of Republicans and Democrats who said they had a great deal or a fair amount of trust um, was equal, about nine and ten. Um, two years later, it's still about nine and ten among Democrats less than half of Republicans. So I think, you know, and we also look at Fauci, Fauci drops even lower among Republicans. So I think it's really striking, right, that that prior to this, there was a seemingly high level of trust of the CDC that has really plummeted. And, and the CDC is going to have to do work in order to regain that trust. What was the, what was the level of recognition of the CDC? I mean, name recognition or like understanding of what it does? The average scientist in the CDC, huge, hugely demoralized, understanding that they were once seen as heroes and now they're basically villains in people's eyes. Really, really like depression, uh, wanting to retire, wanting to quit, feeling just so upset. I've had scientists tell me, you know, that somebody threw a glass of water in their face because they, you know, they said they were from the CDC. That would never have happened before. And so you just, there is a, a level of sadness, I think. And, um, and and there is some acknowledgement that they need to change, uh, but maybe not as much as there needs to be. That was super useful. I, I actually think I must have misstated my question a little bit because I was just I was just wondering when you look at approval of, and trust in the CDC, like how many people have actually heard of the CDC or know what it does. Pre, yeah. you know, well, before no, 2020. I'm not actually sure that the 
public needs to know exactly what the CDC does on every different level because the CDC does so much, right? But it's just that the they, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they are the organization that makes recommendations in in the safety and health, right? And and a large share of the public is aware of that aspect of the CDC. Now, whether they understand the nuances, you know, the, right. probably not not half as well as a poor knows, right? So. Um, uh, are there other countries that we can learn from that, that their responses or experiences? I mean, you do something, part, you know, one of your uh, co-authors has that more comparativist perspective or there, and you, and it, it's woven through the book. Are, are there countries that, that we, we can look to in the future for? I mean, I think we can think about, you know, what are kind of cases that look like the U.S. Um, and did better and some that look like the U.S and did just as poorly, right? So yes, both um, both Tom and Sarah are comparativists. So Sarah mostly works in Europe and Tom works um, political economy in Asia. Um, and so throughout the book, we kind of think about the UK as a potential model, right? We can think about, you know, it's very different in that it has a national healthcare system, but it also has, it's highly polarized, um, like the US um, had a kind of, conservative leader throughout and in their performance on all the metrics in terms of excess deaths and um, are as much better, right? And part of that is, you know, Boris Johnson never makes it, you know, this an issue of like conservatives do this and everyone else does this other thing, right? There was much less, there was much more kind of consistency in terms of the messaging. Um, obviously, we know that he was kind of partying while, you know, during lockdowns and that kind of thing. But at least the kind of messaging was much more consistent about masking and lockdowns and um, and vaccination. Brazil is another kind of case study that we look at, right, with a very a right wing populist leader, um, deep inequality, um, racial inequality in, in um, you know, historic ways, like in the U.S. And, you know, the excess deaths look a lot like the U.S. on um, the kind of polarized, uh, on the kind of ideological grounds in ways that we are, are more similar to the U.S. than other places in Latin America. Um, so those are the kinds of things, you know, do we want to take lessons from there? I don't know. I mean, probably a national health care system would have been better um, in, than in the U.S., more general access to medical care and uh, less inequality. But even in places that are deeply polarized, we didn't see the same kinds of, um, we didn't see the same kind of challenges in terms of getting people vaccinated and getting them, um, you know, wearing masks and all that as we did um, in the U.S. So I think a lot of that is about leadership, even like if the preconditions are pretty sim similar. Your point about John, about Boris Johnson and the parties and all that made me think about something in the book because obviously it took a while, but there have been, there were consequences for that action sure. by Johnson. And one of the, there's one section earlier in your book where you talk about how, you know, there were fewer consequences. There, there didn't seem to be quite the same level of consequence for the early mismanagement of COVID as there were for like, we think there were consequences for George W. Bush's handling of Katrina, for example, like other disasters have seemed to have more immediate political consequences. Do you have, I mean, do, yeah, do you I mean, feel like I, there's I, an overall, you know, because of polarization, a kind of lack of consequence for mismanagement, political mismanagement? Yeah, I mean, I think this is one of the downstream effects of, of polarization and the kind of rolling of all of our identities together is that like your team, you have to believe in your team and believe that they're doing a good job um, regardless of whether they are in fact doing a good job or not. And so the kind of accountability, it like breaks the accountability mechanism. That's not to say that no, I mean, Donald Trump, doesn't get reelected. Um, so like that's a pretty big consequence, but um, but it's not, but but Ron DeSantis is still in office and will probably get reelected. And you know, a lot of the folks where we're seeing like, you know, Christy Nome and the other folks where we see like what is quite bad management of public health are still in office, still rising stars in the party. And there seems to be not a lot of accountability for COVID itself, right? Maybe that, you know, Trump, it kind of is wrapped up in lots of other things. Um, so polarization 
means that and the deep polarization and the kind of Trumpian way of like taking little accountability also means that voters are free to kind of discount things that they that even that that are in fact bad like that we have had a million excess deaths right from covid but i do think that the the lack of trust in even that statistic is playing a role here too right it's the the republicans perhaps don't um don't feel the need to hold anyone accountable because they think the death toll has been inflated and it's not as bad as it was portrayed in the media. And so um, if anything, they are um, favoring their politicians for standing up to scientists and not requiring vaccines and for state workers or whatever it may be, right? So I think I think all of this is so wrapped up in all of these topics we've been talking about, so. Porva, do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, I mean, I, I agree. I think it's we've seen sort of both sides of it, people being punished, so to speak, for going a certain way, but also a lot of people saying, oh, I'm so glad that you went this way and, you know, really called the bluff on these scientists because COVID was nothing. And so it's going to be, I think, a longer term um you know, space to see how it happens over the longer term, because I, I really do believe, as I said earlier, that, that things are going to look very different in a couple of years in terms of how people view the pandemic. At least I, I, I think so. We'll see. I do want to just make a point that was related to something Aporva said earlier about the CDC, is that one of the, I think, consequences um, that's not about accountability, but it's about like wrong and blame and wrong accountability is that there has been an increase in threats and assaults on healthcare workers um, in, in the last two years, both the people who run these systems, but also like just people who are working as nurses and doctors. And a lot of that is partially about misinformation, but part of it is if you can't take your accountability, if like you blame, you know, the doctor for not saving, you know, your family member from COVID, or, you know, that there's just a lot of, um, there's a lot of misplaced blame about who actually, you know, messed up in, in this terrible pandemic that I think it's being taken out on people who are lower down and who are probably have not no responsibility for, you know, the, the outcomes, but are easier to get to essentially, right? So that we've seen increases in political violence generally in the last, you know, decade, but specifically on healthcare workers. And I think that is relatively new. Yeah, I think the last question here kind of uh, goes directly to that issue of blame and credit. Um, the the questioner says that the book shows the relationship between blame and cre blame credit and the actual understanding of the problem itself and the information. And I get and the question I think is is there ways we could use or you know kind of manipulate blame and credit. Uh, in the future, like, for example, if you named all the vaccines after Trump or, you know, really did more to, you know, identify him with with vaccines being, you know, I, I think there are probably a dozen examples of of that about how you could sort of create different understandings of blame and credit. Is there you want to? Yeah, no, I think this is a great point. Like, and Tom, Sarah and I have talked about this a lot. Like, it's actually puzzling in some sense that Trump didn't take more credit for the vaccine, right? He doesn't, right? Like this guy loves branding everything, just call it the Trump vaccine, right? I, I don't think you would have necessarily, you know, that's one of the things that his administration did right. They put all this money and they into the vaccine development and they did it quickly and they got a safe vaccine within less than a year, which is, I know like, that's pretty stunning, right? And they got it in people's arms in less than a year. Like, take some credit for that. That's what politicians do. And it's a little bit surprising in some ways that that was not the choice that they made because I think it would have made a difference, right? Do I don't think it would have necessarily depressed Democrats' willingness to get vaccinated. And it may have on the margins increased. But what has happened is that you know, Trump has has advocated for the vaccine publicly, but not while he um, but in rallies and he gets booed right. when he does it now. Right. But had they done it earlier, had they taken had he taken more credit, I think it would have mattered a great deal in terms of vaccine uptake. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, a lot of what politicians do, right, is they try and take credit for good things and put the blame on other people. And so I think 
that certainly is the case that um, there could have been different ways that his administration and also, I mean, Biden takes credit for all the for the vaccines, right? Like right. he took he took office after the vaccines were developed. I mean, they got them in people's arms, but that you know, like that's what he's been doing since he got in office was taking credit for the vaccines. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's it was difficult for the Trump administration to embrace the vaccines publicly after framing the virus as not as big of a health risk that you don't need to be worried about it, that it, then it's very hard to be like, but you should get vaccinated, right? And so I think that was, had, had they not done that framing from the beginning, then I think we would have seen them embrace the vaccines in the way that you're alluding to. But I think because they were trying to frame the, the pandemic early on um, as, you know, not something that they needed, that the public needed to be worried about, that, that they then could not embrace the vaccines. Yeah, I agree with that. I think there was a choice they had to make. Either the virus is a big deal and you need the vaccines or it's not. And you can just, yeah, don't don't have to do it. I mean, he never really got um, photographed getting the vaccine, right? He didn't kind of want right. visual proof of that, even if he was going to talk about it. I think that was a very conscious choice. And, and I actually, I wonder if some Democrats would actually not have wanted to get the vaccine if it was called Trump vaccine. Already the warp speed was making everybody nervous, not just Republicans. You know, the idea that this thing was developed in a year, as miraculous as we know it to be now at the time, it was like, did they cut corners? I mean, I myself was also like, well, did the FDA really push things through under pressure from the White House, perhaps? There were so many questions about it that if you then on top of it called the Trump vaccine, I don't know, maybe there would have been some some hesitation there. Right. I mean, they also dramatically, he always wanted to overstate cures rather than vaccines, um, including, you know, including like when he got sick and he announced that everybody would get whatever the experimental antibody. monoclonal yeah. antibody thing was, um, which is a weird, a weird reaction. All right. Any, uh, this has been a really wonderful conversation. Any last thoughts from Shana or, or, just thank you so much for engaging. This has been so, so great to, I mean, I'm sorry to give you all PTSD and relive the the first year of the pandemic, um, but it's really helpful to, th- you know, think through it with other, with other people. Yeah, I mean, I hope that this book is a one-off and it doesn't apply to any other pandemics that come <laughs> our way. That's my closing thought. You'll have to find other topics for the future, for your future books. Here. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, and you know, as as much as I said that this was tricking, it's really an excellent book and really excellent research. So thank you for for taking the time to write it and um, and having it as part of the public history. Yeah, yeah, it, it's really a wonderful book. And you know, for those still watching uh, on the event page, there's a link to to purchase the book, which I, I totally recommend. I, I think it's really one of the best. It's not just a book about the pandemic or public health, but as a snapshot of American politics, or not not even a snapshot, a kind of moving picture of American politics over the last, you know, five years, really, I think it's just just amazing. Thank you. So I'm proud to have been able to be to, to host this uh, conversation. I really appreciate all of you being part of it. Thank you for asking. Okay.